Welcome back to the second section of uh, today's itinerary. Um, my name, if you don't know who I am, my name is Frank Teichert. I'm the archaeologist here at um, the Cultural History Museum, and I will be facilitating this next process. But before we start, I'd just like to please warn people, when you come down the stairs, just be careful that you do not slip um, on the edges. Um, we've already had one or two slight mishaps, so just be careful when you come and sit. I know the lights get in your eyes, and then you might not actually judge the steps um, correctly, but please just be careful. Okay, thank you very much. So this section of the uh, discussions is a discussion um, section dialogue where we have some honorable guests here today and I will be introducing them and also posing a question that they will hopefully then um, be able to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes and after that, um, after each speaker, we'll open the floor so that um, people may ask questions. Okay, so we needed to jumble around the uh, speakers because one of our speakers is, hasn't arrived yet. So we will carry on with um, the first person that I'll be introducing is um, Razia Sali, who is um, from the Nelson Mandela Foundation and um, is part of the Poison Pasts exhibition. So I will pose a question. Um, so, Musali, Nelson Mandela is regarded as a nation builder and strove for reconciliation. Five years after his death, the concept of reconcil reconciliation is challenged. What can we learn in a critical way on how President Mandela dealt with our poisonous past? Thank you. Hello, everybody. I think that's a big question. Um, we at the Nelson Mandela Foundation are mindful of the fact that uh, Madiba's legacy is under scrutiny, and we welcome that. Madiba himself said that uh, he's not a saint and that we needed to interrogate him. He said remembering the past is about interrogating it. Um, so just to, to go back, uh, Madiba comes from a long tradition of uh, looking for a common solution to all of South Africa's problems. Um, so in... Uh, the, just after the Second World War, when the United Nations was established, the African National Congress uh, adopted a document called African Claims, which was based on the Atlantic Charter, looking at uh, what the problems in South Africa were and how they could be best addressed by all the people in South Africa. And then if you fast forward in 1955, the ANC drew up uh, the Freedom Charter and the Congress of the People, which stated that the land belongs to all who live in it, and South Africa also belongs to all who live in it. Um, so it was also um, uh, a document that looked at uh, social cohesion, that looked at uh, all South Africans, uh, being all the people in South Africa who identified with it. And then in the early 1960s, Mariba was involved in the All in Africa conference, which was an attempt to uh, unite all the different people in South Africa uh, to look at a national convention. So the call to the apartheid government at that time was to hold a national convention of all South Africans to draw a common future. So he comes from a long tradition of working, uh, of seeing a solution um, to South Africa's many problems uh, in, in a common vision. Um, when he was in prison, uh, he says in his autobiography that it gave him an opportunity to reflect on all the big issues of the day. And uh, it also gave him 
an insight because he studied Afrikaans. He learned, he studied Afrikaner history. So it gave him an insight into the mind of what we called at that time the enemy. So he began uh, initiating discussions with the apartheid government. Uh, uh, he was quite clear that he was talking about the need for talks. He wasn't actually negotiating while he was in prison. He said he, as a prisoner, couldn't do that. Uh, in um, uh, 19, in the, uh, when he was offered uh, to be released in 1985, his daughter, Zinzi Mandela, read out his famous speech uh, at Jabulani Theater, Amphitheater where he says that prisoners cannot negotiate, only free men can negotiate. So he was quite clear in his discussions with Kobi Kutsia, P.W. Bertha, Neil Barnard, the people from the apartheid uh, government, that uh, he wasn't the person that they needed to talk to. They needed to talk to the representatives of the people, namely the African National Congress. So in 1990, after he was released, he led the delegation uh, of, the, uh, of the meetings that were held between the apartheid government, the ANC, and the other liberation movements which had formed the Patriotic Front. And the whole point about the whole negotiations process from 1990 until the breakthrough and the elections on uh, the 27th of April 1994 was actually, it was a negotiation. So neither the apartheid government nor the ANC were victorious in the absolute sense. So it wasn't like a People's Liberation Army marching uh, through the streets of Pretoria, so to speak, and taking over. It was a negotiations, and negotiations by definition are... Uh, are discussing a problem and coming to some sort of an agreement. So Madiba himself saw the whole process of liberation as a process, as it unfolds. With the, with the transformation that occurred after the 94 elections, um, uh, Madiba agreed to be president for one term only, and then in 99, when he stood down, he uh, passed on the work to a younger generation. And we, we, we know today that uh, the problems and the legacies of apartheid still persist. And um, Madiba would be the first to, to acknowledge, I think, that we haven't done enough to address these, those problems. The inequality between the rich and the poor is still it's a widening gap. The, the, the spatial separation between the those who have wealth and those who don't is also, you know, hasn't really been broken down. So the problems that current day South Africa faces are huge. And uh, I think that the whole negotiation process was a path towards uh, seeking a better future for all, but it wasn't an end, end uh, to that. So we are sitting with those legacies and we are in the last... Uh, 10, 15 years, we have not really uh, grappled with a lot of those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sally. Are, are there any questions at this stage? If... Yes. Uh, my question is, do you have programs that um, participate in court and encourage the judiciary in terms of Bring South Africans together. Um, there's still a problem where we go to a location eh, and a white person goes there. People, they get away. Are there programs that bring us together, or do we have a plan maybe, that helps people to maybe combine ideas where we can, uh, how can I put this? Bring together minds from the rural areas and the south. Um, what I'm trying to say is, how do we bring together groups? When we take people from the elite, whether it be white elite, the black elite, the ANC, whatever it is, bring them to locations, take people to locations, bring them to areas like this, when we inform each other, and then after that comes the solution as a company. Uh, 
Um, we have various uh, programs at the foundation. Uh, in the past, we had various social cohesion programs where we would have dialogues in various communities and invite people from different sectors. Um, at the moment, our focus is on looking at issues around land and early childhood development uh, as, as a key focus in the current period. Um, we also have various um, other memory-related dialogues where we look at intergenerational conflict, uh, um, um, work around trauma and violence and things like that. So, so we have attempted to... to, to, to uh, to, to bring communities together, but it's, at the moment it's not a key focus because we also think sometimes it, it can't just be a superficial bringing together of different communities, but we need a more deeper reflection and a more deeper engagement, and we, we, we are working towards that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've just been reminded that maybe we should pose questions afterwards so that uh, you know, all our panel speakers... Um, can then be on, um, asked questions. So if you have burning questions, please just try and remember them um, and we'll do it um, afterwards. Okay, <clears throat> my next question will be for Jabulani Filajo. I hope, that, I, hope I say that right. Um, he works at um, in museums also. He's from Freedom Park and um, Here's my question. Museums are spaces where representation of our past, our culture, and way of lives are portrayed. Can you talk to us about your understanding of past, present, poisonous past, and how in museums we can contribute in resolving the challenge? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, uh and uh, this is quite a difficult, difficult question to, you know, to respond to. But I think it's important uh, for us to engage with such questions. Uh, firstly, just the issue of the surname. I think you asked the question if you if you pronounced it correctly. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't correctly. It's <laughs> it's Pelago. Yeah, it's Pelago. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. We, we, we yeah, try and yeah, make yeah. it all fancy when we, when we try and say it if we don't understand it. So I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, it's fine. We are forgiven. Even before you made a mistake, you were forgiven. <laughs> okay. Um, the issue of poisoned paths um, and how it's reflected in our heritage spaces. I'm going to try and broaden it to heritage spaces rather than just museums. Uh, firstly, just to say that um, it's important for us to understand that as South Africa, we're not the only country that has been through such a past uh, in charting uh, our future. Um, almost all countries have poisoned past. You know, uh, I remember a few years ago, I went to, to Sweden, and you know, Scandinavian countries are known as, you know, very peaceful countries, you know, a very good past, you know, and um, uh, they, they even have something called uh, a feminist foreign policy, you know, have you ever heard of such, you know, feminist foreign policy, you know, which means they very much, you know, advanced in terms of issues of gender, you know, and all of that inclusive and um, the social democrats were in power there, and they laid a very powerful foundation, you know, for the for the for, for the Swedish society, which is doing quite well. But there we were in Kalma, a very small town, and um, there's an island called Orland, and in that island, uh, an archaeological excavation has actually had actually uh, led to a discovery that there was a very violent event that had taken place, you know, amongst the Swedes themselves. And it was so violent that when it emerged, you know, uh, there was, it was a, a national story. And Swedes, knowing themselves as people who have a good past, 
were actually surprised, you know, that they have such a past. But what's important is that after that, there was then a, an international conference organized to deal with violent pasts, organized in Sweden to engage with this issue using that um, uh, uh, event as a, as, as a foundation. Now, that's in Sweden. And uh, in Finland, uh, last year, they were celebrating the 100 years of their democracy. We were celebrating how many years, by the way? You know, so... Yeah, we're quite, we quite a young democracy. So they were celebrating 100 years last year. And I then got to find out that after 1917, uh, there was a civil war, a very serious civil war, which actually uh, even threatened to, 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 to destroy Finland as a country. Now, the Scandinavian countries, as I said, are known as countries that are very good past, but they have violent past. So we need to, one of the things that I think we need to note is to move away from this thing of exceptionalizing our poisoned past or our violent past. It's normal. You know, the United States, I don't have to go there. We know what went through there. We know what's going on. There wouldn't, be a, a, there wouldn't be a Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. if there wasn't a violent past which bequeathed such a present. So there's nothing exceptional about us. So let's just engage. Let's just be open and objective and engage with our issues. Now, in terms of the heritage landscape, um, one of the most critical things that I think one needs to do when engaging with such issues is to look at issues of perspectives. What perspective are we using when engaging with our heritage? Um, I'm quite honored because I'm amongst the youth uh, who are championing the idea of the decolonization of education institutions because I think that is critical. We can never engage with issues of heritage in a revolutionary way without locating it within the issue of the decolonization of knowledge, the decolonization of institutions. And what does that mean? It means maybe not bringing in new narratives, maybe looking at the former marginalized narratives. Uh, narratives which were basically, you know, suppressed and oppressed. And, 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 and one of those perspectives is the African perspective. So when people talk about the Africanization of the university or the decolonization of the university, with, of a university, of universities, of institutions, of knowledge, we need to take that very serious because it then has got an impact in terms of decolonizing the heritage landscape because the perspectives on which heritage is founded are colonial. And once we confront that, we can never engage with issues of dealing with our poisoned past from other narratives, from other perspectives, from previously marginalized perspectives. So I think that's, if we, if we move uh, from that perspective, I think then we will be then uh, moving from uh, a good foundation. Let me just give an example. Because when you decolonize, it means then you deal with the issue of language. You then need to, to ask the question of what is, heritage, what is heritage from an African perspective? And for you to get there, you, you need to start questions of asking questions like, what is, what is the past from an African perspective? Because past is linked to your heritage. And it's also linked to issues of legacies. Now, for, for an example, uh, someone speaking from a uh, 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 we had a, a Zulu-speaking mother. Uh, I'm stressing that, a Zulu-speaking mother. So I'm going to be speaking from a Zulu perspective because that's the language that I suckled from my mother's what? titties. <laughs> yeah. So 
from the Zulu perspective, you talk about history, you say umlando. There is an element of fetching something from the past for the present. And from that perspective, you privilege the present. So you don't stay in the past. You don't stay in the past. And that's very important. And, 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 and once you, you engage with issues of fetching from the, from the past, then you ask questions of, in terms of our heritage, what is the usable heritage? What heritage do we need to preserve? What heritage do we need to share? What heritage do we need to celebrate? And if you look at our heritage, we're coming from a poisoned past. We're coming from a violent past. Now, from an African perspective, what do you deal with? How do you deal with a violent past? What do you deal with violent heritage? But the word itself, umlando, means that you fetch. You only fetch it when you need it. You don't stay in that violent. It's gone, that violent past. We're in the present now. We need to move to the future. But then, we, but then the, 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 the challenge of the present is that the past is so much present in the present that you just cannot ignore it. And we need then to ask questions of how do we deal with this past which is in our veins, you know, in engaging with the present, not the future, the present. So uh, those are just some of the... I'm just trying to say that one needs to deal with the issue of perspective, if one needs to want to address the issue of the violent past, the issue of um, of, of poisoned uh, past, uh, in addressing the present, because we can't address the future, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. You know, people will say, "Hey, hey, the future, hey, the future." Who knew what South Africa was going to be in this situation like this year? Did we prepare for it? How could we have prepared for it? So we deal with the present, with today. Um, and, and so in, in, in terms of uh, how do we engage with the violent past in terms of the heritage landscape, I think we need to accept the fact that our heritage landscape is violent. Our heritage landscape is violent. If you walk past a statue of someone who was involved in your dispossession, in your marginalization, in your deculturation, what happens to your mind? What, that, 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 that violence that is inflicted on you continuously, how do you deal with that? So we need to face the fact that heritage promotes certain values. So if you see a statue, it's not just to, you know, this, you know, this guy posing, you know. There's certain messages that are being conveyed. You are celebrating that person. You are honoring the values that that person promoted. So now, if in the present heritage, heritage landscape, we have conflicting values portrayed by our heritage, what type of a future or of a present are we creating? Isn't the present going to be reflective of the heritage landscape? Why do we ask questions if students rise up and say roads must fall? It's because our heritage is promoting and creating and perpetuating conflict and violence. And we need to engage with those issues and bring in people who will explain very well the impact of knowledge in the public domain, because that's what heritage is. A statue is knowledge in the public domain. It's information, it's values in the public domain. What, what do they do? to people who are engaging with that space. So, um, I think it's, it's, it, 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 it calls for 
an example which I gave earlier. That's when the Swedish discovered, you know, this space, which was reflecting a violent past, a Swedish violent past. They called a conference, an international conference, so as to equip themselves in terms of how do you deal with such issues. And I think that is what needs to happen. There has to be an engagement in terms of how do we deal with this. But then we need to, when that is done, one needs to take into consideration that the politics of heritage, that heritage is not just something that's neutral, you know, you know, you just put up a statue. There's a lot of engagements that takes place before it's decided, for an example, which heritage, whose heritage, why this heritage, for how long. So that engagement, I think it's more important than the product itself. So I think that um, in, in, in closing, it's important that we engage with perspectives, issue of perspectives, and we need to open doors for, the, for decolonized perspectives, you know, and we need to open our minds to um, questions around heritage, you know, like why, for an example, we, we, why are we always bombarded with certain heritage figures? Do we think that it just happens? No. No, it's just not like that. Some people somewhere take decisions that this is the heritage that we are promoting. So we actually are consumers of heritage. So how do we become heritage literate so that we become critical when someone imposes um, a heritage engagement or a heritage product on us. We critically engage with that product and we understand the behind the scenes in terms of the thinking behind it, uh, what it's trying to promote and uh, what motivated for, 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 for such. So I think in terms of how to um, the heritage industry or the heritage spaces engage with issues of the poison past, unfortunately we have to start from the basics, as I said, starting from perspectives and then move from there. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, interesting uh, answer to the question. Um, I'd just like to welcome um, our fourth speaker, or who has just arrived uh, all the way from, where's it from? King Williamstown, Eastern Cape somewhere. Graf Renet, sorry. And it's just somewhere there. <laughs> They're close to each other, aren't they? One's here and one's there, right? Okay. Just, 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 just checking. Okay. Our next uh, uh, question, person who has to answer a question, um, and I'll introduce is Dr. Don Prinsloer. Um, Dr. Prinsloer wrote uh, a, a book about P.W. Boerter. Um, so here's my question. Dr. Prinsloer, you wrote a biography of President P.W. Boerter that may have given you great insight of how the state works at the time. Uh, could you share with us what we, we, what we could learn from this and what new narrative we should strive for? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the brief answer is yes, I learned a lot. But before I get there, I have a wife and uh, three daughters, and I would like to remind us that we are in the middle of the 16-day campaign against violence against women and children. Now, the reason why I raise that up front is that my longer answer to the qualified yes is based, and I would like to partly or largely link to my colleague on my right, about the past and the violence of the past. 
So I'm going to answer the question in chunks. A lot of what I wrote about in the biography of P.W. Boota I already knew. If I had been born in China, I would have had slanted eyes and spoken Chinese. If I had been born in ancient Australia, I would have been an Aborigine with the ancient Aborigine religion. I was born in an Afrikaner home and I grew up as an Afrikaner. You drink your mother's milk from the day you are born. And it takes, it took me decades of my life to realize what life really is about. And the introspection that many Afrikaners had taken long before apartheid ended and indeed after that was linked to the question, why? Why did all of this happen? And that goes back to the ancient past. And if I may say, our facilitator is an archaeologist and he must correct me whenever I say something wrong. I grew up in an average Christian home. And for most of my childhood, the only, just about the only book in the house was the children's Bible. And I learned and believed that the universe, the earth, all living things on earth, including our human beings, that all of that, they were created in six days. I believe that. And there are still many American supporters of Donald Trump who believe it to this day. That the earth is flat, created in six days. Only afterwards I learned that the universe is about 14,000 million years old. Our planet Earth about 4,000 million years old. Primitive life on Earth about three to 4,000 million years old. I'm going to say something very personal and anybody who gets upset at what I'm saying Please, my humble apologies. The archaeologist facilitator will know what Australopithecus is. It's the southern great ape. The first so-called human-like being on earth, Homo habilis, which lived about three million years ago, was a descendant of that southern great ape of Africa. And Homo habilis was the ancestor of Homo sapiens, which is all of us. So one of the lessons I learned in life is that we are all the same. We are family, not only with each other, but also with nature and our animal friends. I also learned in recent times that our ancestors, who probably, and you might agree or disagree with me, from about three million years ago, 300,000 years ago, or ago, it originated in what is now Kenya and Tanzania. And they moved out of those areas into different parts of Africa and the world, and archaeological evidence suggests that the Koi and the Sun were present along the southern African south coast, west coast, around about 60,000, 70,000 years ago. But Homo sapiens also left for Europe, Asia, all over the world. And I started thinking, but you know, if we're all family, why do we fight so much? Why are there so much incidents of violence against human beings? And again, I'm glad the archaeologist is with us. The human being, Homo sapiens, survived because it killed off all other competitors. Neanderthal, 
All the other homo species was killed off by homo sapiens for the sake of survival. So we are by nature aggressive. It's part of our DNA. And just for interest's sake, a couple of years ago when I was reading about our beginnings in Eastern Africa, I sent my DNA to a laboratory in Dallas, Texas to do my DNA analysis. And it shocked my family, it fascinated me, might be interesting to those of you who are sitting with us. Scandinavian, the Vikings, consist of 44.5% of my DNA. Anglo-Saxon, which was quite a surprise for me because my family died in the British concentration camps and they hated the English. But that's 37%. Roman or Italian of the Roman Empire, 12.1%. Kenya, 2.3%. 2.3% of my DNA is of the original mother of all humans from Kenya. And then Middle Eastern Arab, 2%. Probably those who went to Europe, the Muslim invaders of Spain, intermarried with my ancestors. And the last one, just as surprising, Ashkenazi Jewish, 2%. So I'm 2% Arab, 2% Jewish, 2.3% Kenyan. What I'm trying to say, Chair, our ancestors, and my apologies to people who are very religiously inclined, all the religions of the world created myths. Myths about creation, myths about male dominance. Where does violence against women come from? From our main religions. And who drafted those holy books? Male priests, mainly. So, the things that happened in the past, it's in our DNA, and the way to repair those things is to deal with our inherent nature. Now, getting closer back to your question, and you will excuse me if I put some evidence on the table. Another thing that I learned through writing the biography of Mr. Buddha, my family ties, I'm partly Natal, partly Free State. He was from the Free State. We share some family relationship, but I worked for him for 10 years. I started the biography after he had his stroke. I did a lot of research and... Much of it was from classified cabinet documents. I got hold of uh, top secret recordings of cabinet and cabinet committee meetings. I don't know how much, how far your institutional memory goes back with regard to the reforms that P.W. Wurta was trying, was trying to make the three chamber parliament and then trying to involve blacks. But there was a special cabinet committee trying to forge ahead with the involvement of the blacks in the central political system and to release Nelson Mandela. The main opposition to that was from one Friedrich Willem de Klerk, F.W. de Klerk. He was vehemently opposed to any involvement of blacks in the political system of South Africa. And I found recordings where he said so. And he said so in very blunt terms. Now at that stage I was working in the public service. P.W. Boota was retired. And in order for me and Mr. Boota to have that manuscript, approved, it had to be approved by F.W. de Klerk and his legal advisor. 
And when they saw what I had written and quoted F.W. de Klerk on his far-right stance, his opposition, you may remember Chris Hearnes trying to involve black people in the political system, the Klerk's opposition to the release of Mr. Mandela, opposition to any movement in that direction, and I quoted him verbally. That's when I met up with uh, fake news. FW censors book after wiping out PW tapes. So I'm not telling a state secret. It was on the front page of the Sunday Times. The clerk and his law advisor changed the manuscript. They deleted the parts where he was very racist and right-wing. And they changed the text of the manuscript as it was. Where was it now? As it was ultimately published. And they told me and P.W. Buerta... I will allow the publication of that censored book on condition that you accept my editing. We had no choice because otherwise the classified material could not have been used. That's just a snippet. I learned about fake news and we are seeing a lot of it today. I was almost tempted, uh, Chair, reflecting on the past week's fake news that we can easily change the... Uh, topic of today's discussion to poisoned narratives and new pasts. <laughs> what I also learned and what came out starkly during those days and it's no surprise to me today that the ANC has factions. The National Party, right from the outset, had its factions. There were the so-called Liberal Free State and Cape Province and to an extent Natal factions. I'm from Natal, so I was more liberal. And the Conservative Transvaal Party. Now the first Prime Minister under the national government after 48 was the Cape Townian, T.F. Malon, and things were still fairly okay then. Then we had a series of Stradom, Malon, Verwoerd, Foster, who were all Transvaalers, and things really turned bad during those days. A second bit of evidence about this factionalism, excuse me for digging out my own past I don't know how many of you remember the black sash in the olden days, vehemently anti-apartheid. Now, I was a young lecturer at the Rand of Afrikaans University, and they asked me to write about South African politics. And if I may just quote, and they even quoted in a large block, Political freedom lies in the granting of political rights and responsibilities to every, to every citizen to participate in the process of government. This was a black sash in February 1976. The reason why the National Party and the ANC have different factions is that you are a product of your birth. You speak the language that you are learned at home, at your mother's knee. You adopt the religion in your home. You adopt the political party. And it's only decades later when you realize things are not going well. Okay. P.W. Buerta then started to change apartheid, to move away. He scrapped the apartheid, uh, the... Uh, Immorality Act, the Group Areas Act, and he was busy reshaping the political landscape, but he was blocked by F.W. de Klerk, and F.W. de Klerk's first speech he made after he became leader of the National Party in 1989 
was a document produced by Mr. Chris Yunus to which the clerk had been opposed to in cabinet while they were busy doing it, before he took over the National Party. So the next thing I learned is that many politicians are swayed by the wind. And that goes even for today if we listen to the evidence at the Zondo Commission. So, Chair, to summarize what I've learned is that we should move away from the myths and the legends on which we grew up, which tainted our vision, which resulted in ideologies which we believe to be false because it's a mythical and a legendary thing. And we have ideologies like fascism, nationalism, national socialism, Marxism, whatever. We fight world wars about them. We must go back to the basics. And if I say it's in our DNA to be aggressive, one of the new narratives it should be how do we fight our own DNA? How do we promote humanism and Ubuntu against our own nature? Again, as you might know, the very first things that the ancient man three, three million years ago and, le and earlier made, two things, tools and weapons. So right from the birth of Homo sapiens, we were making things and killing other things. If we don't realize that, gee, we'll have a battle to reach the point where my colleague Amar Wright said we must be moving on. We don't know what tomorrow no it bring, will bring. We know what happened in the past. We know why it happened. And that is what we must strive towards. So those are some of the things that I learned. I learned many secrets. I learned many things about human nature, etc., etc. But I don't think that's of concern in the type of debate that we have today in order to reconcile ourselves and reconcile the past, the reasons why it happened, and moving into a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prinska. Uh, some, some interesting insights there, and, and, and your, your ancient history is not too bad. Uh, we'll discuss a few points later, but it's not too, not too bad. Okay, moving on, I'd like now to pose a question to Tando Sipuye. I hope that's right. If not, we'll talk about it later. Okay. Um, uh, Tando is from um, the Robert Sabukwe Foundation, um, and you'll be seeing an exhibition a little bit later on Robert Sabukwe. So my question, uh, Tando, what can we all learn from the life of Sabukwe, and especially today's generation? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the question, and I greet you, and I greet my fellow panelists, and I think I want to firstly take this opportunity to apologize for arriving late. Um, I also think that uh, before I, I answer that question, it is quite significant that uh, we are here gathered and, and discussing you know, um, issues around our heritage and poisoned pasts, particularly in this month of uh, November, especially in relation to Robert Sobukwe. And I just want to say, uh, highlight the fact that it was on the 1st of November 1977 that uh, Robert Sobukwe was readmitted at Khrotskir Hospital in Cape Town after he had been discharged on the 15th of October 1977, following an operation that was conducted him, on him by Dr. Bernard. Sobukwe had been admitted at uh, Khrotskir, in fact, on the 12th of September 1977. And uh, he was operated on without the knowledge of his family, without his wife, Mama Zondeni Sobukwe, being informed, for an alleged uh, cancerous lung tumor. And so I, I, I just want to say that 
it is quite significant that we are discussing that. But the other point that I want to mention in relation to Sobukwe is that Sobukwe did not die a natural death. Sobukwe is one of the many people, revolutionaries here in this country who were systematically assassinated through various means. Uh, Mama Sobukwe in 1995 testified before the Truth Commission and said that Uba Sobukwe, while he was incarcerated indefinitely on Robben Island, he was poisoned. He was given food with glasses. And you would know that Sobukwe was isolated all alone for six years on Robben Island. And uh, he was subjected to that. And I want to locate the poisoning and the systematic assassination of Sobukwe within the context of the discussion of uh, Project Coast, you know, started by, uh, which was led by Voter Basson, Dr. Death, and uh, with people like uh, P.W. Bota, who were president, the state president at that time. And Project Coast was a project that was intended on developing synthetic chemical and biological weapons that would be used against particularly the African revolutionaries, black freedom fighters to be specific. And, uh, you know, there are a number of synthetic diseases, a number of um, chemical poisons that were developed by that program. Um, furthermore, we know that they also developed a number of drugs that would be distributed in the black community, things such as the ticks and the mandrax and so forth. You know, and so for me, I, I want to, to, to move from that premise and say that here I want to speak about Sobukwe as one of those many revolutionaries who were poisoned, deliberately, systematically assassinated. Because very often when we speak of Sobukwe, we say that he died and people would assume that he died a natural death because it's said that uh, he died of cancer in 1978. But Sobukwe was killed by the collaboration of the racist apartheid state together with the medical establishment. People such as Dr. Bernard who operated him without the knowledge or the consent of his family. You know, and others who are still alive for uh, even if I can mention that, you know. And one of the things I should say is that there's never been even a so-called commission of inquiry or even an inquest into the murder of Robert Mangaliso Sobukwa. So I want to move from that premise first and foremost. And then um, secondly, I want to say that Sobukwe was a man of noble character a visionary leader, a thinker, a pragmatic political activist, and an ideologue. Sobukwe was also a very simple man. He was a Methodist church preacher. He was a teacher. He was also a university lecturer. And in saying he was a university lecturer, I want to emphasize that point too. Because in history and when we read, he's referred to as, a, as an assistant in the Department of uh, African Studies at Vets University. But Sobukwe, in fact, he was lecturing then. He was busy on a lecturing post on a daily and consistent basis, lecturing African languages at Vets University. Sobukwe was a grounded man. He was a gardener. He was a father. He was a husband, a brother. And Sobukwe was an outstanding man a political leader, a prisoner, a graduate, an economist, a lawyer, the man most feared by the racist apartheid authorities. And he was deemed by men such as Foster as the most dangerous man in South Africa. And so this is the man that I want to speak about here today. And so you ask the question, Wuti, how can we, uh, you know, a, a, as young people, what can we learn from him? What can we draw from Sobukwe? One of the things I want to say is that in post 
1994 South Africa we have a tragedy of what uh, Chimamanda Ngozi says is the telling the danger of singular narratives the danger of single stories in post 1994 South Africa we tell history from a singular political trajectory uh, my elder here mentioned earlier as i came in that there are some political figures that are celebrated in this country more than others heritage figures and sobukwe is one of the silenced voices in this country i mean i don't have to mention for you all here that there is not even a single public archive that is available of sobukwe's voice and yet you have archives dating back into the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and so forth but you cannot go into any archive in this country you cannot go into any archives or uh, media archives and find interviews you know where you can hear the sound of sobukwe's voice how he may have sounded so for many young people here today i would i usually say that we have no clue how sobukwe may have sounded because he is one of those uh, men whose voices remain silenced even in post 1994 south africa because of this tragedy of the telling of history from a singular political uh, trajectory we loud other leaders above others and i think this is it is a danger that we cause as a nation if we tell history from uh, you know from these narrow singular perspectives celebrate others i mean in speaking of sobukwe i usually like to speak about mama sobukwe many people didn't know even know that mama sobukwe was alive just recently people this nation awoke and knew that the widow of uba uh, umangaliso sobukwe was alive and i want to state earlier in the year uh, the state president uh, honored mama sobukwe and gave her the order of lutuli in silver and i want to inform you here that it was not out of their own volition it was not that the government woke up and decided that now they love mama sobukwe and they want to you know uh, celebrate her it was because of the efforts of young people in soweto the black house collective who nominated mama sobukwe and i was part and parcel of those young people but further than nominating mama sobukwe to receive an order from government and it was a way of saying to the government recognize this woman here she is 90 years old having served suffered and sacrificed for this nation she is living isolated in khraf rainet without any care without any you know any care from this government and so we wanted the government to actually acknowledge her and celebrate her but further than nominating mama sobukwe to receive an order from government we actually wrote a letter to the state president at that time and said that the government should consider actually naming one of the national orders after mama sobukwe because of all the so called national orders that you have in this country none of them are named after a woman none of them are aimed at celebrating women figures in this country who have contributed in shaping our history but you have two of them named after men albert lutuli and or tambo you see and so we said to the government honor this woman honor other women by uh, you know instituting a new national order of course we know that that was uh, you know that uh, that request was not honored by the government but coming back to what uh, young people can learn from sobukwe sobukwe taught us the ideals of self determination self reliance we must be proud of who we are sobukwe came at a time you know the the whole discussion of project coast and the engineering of chemicals and and all of that it comes within a a broader context a broader history of you know the darwinian movement the eugenics movement and all the racist 
uh, pseudosciences that they were creating to try and justify and prove that African people were inferior. And men such as Sobukwe and others, because Sobukwe himself learned from others before him, uh, people such as uh, Dr. Chik Anta Diop, who proved that actually African people are not an inferior race or, of people, and that African people, in fact, are the origin and the beginning of it all. That humanity originates in Africa, but not only humanity, civilization originates in Africa. The first institutions of learning, higher learning, originate, are still found in Africa today. You know, the, the, the founders of the sciences that we learn today, the academic sciences, were here, right here in Africa. Most of the so-called Greek philosophers that are lauded and hailed in all the university and institutions, most of them learned here in Africa. You know, for a number of years. And so Sobukwe came in that context. And these are some of the teachings he taught us that African people, you are not an inferior race. You, in fact, are part and parcel of what he called the human race. And African people are, in fact, the origin of that human race. I mean, it was Chick under Diop who said that there is only one race, and that is the African race. And that race has its origin in Africa, you see. And furthermore, he said, Chick under Diop, that all others are mutations out of the African. And I think that science has proven this over time, that indeed African people, you know, are a supreme people, a supreme uh, a nation of people. And I think these are some of the lessons that we can draw from Sobukwe. You know, African philosophy, loving ourselves, loving our history, loving where we come from as a people, and acknowledging, you know, our oneness with the experiences of our ancestors. I usually say that we are one with our ancestors, and our ancestors are one with us. Whatever African people experienced under slavery, under colonialism, under apartheid, is still with us today. So, rightfully, we, we not only talk of the past as something that is away somewhere there. The past is ever present with us. And we live with the past. You know, it's continuously manifested in our daily lives. I stay in Soweto. I know it for a fact. You know, we see the past. And we see, you know... Um, the effects of racism, white supremacy, which people such as Sobukwe were fighting against, the engineering of, um, you know, our spaces, you know, where we live as African people, and the effects it has on our psyche, you know, and our uh, mental health as, as African people. I think I will end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to all our speakers, I'd like to to thank. Uh, just before we get to questions, I'd just like to acknowledge that the, the embassy of the Ukraine uh, is here. Uh, welcome. Uh, and please come back at some stage. Um, okay, so now I open up the floor to our four uh, guests um, if there are any questions. Traditional and motivational speech by all panelists. I have to adopt your concept, the, the new past. I love it, the new past. But I want to take that new past and challenge Mandela Foundation. Why I challenge Mandela Foundation? Because of the last of the last speaker, because we share the, the same narrative. Um, Mandela Foundation, uh, please, uh, you need to, to realign what you are doing, because what you are doing is exactly the same problem that was was created by the National Party. We love Mandela, but you promote him at, at all costs. When Mandela arrived at Soweto, there were people there. There were man, uh, Mbanzas of Soweto. But they were never told every corner Mandela Beach, every street Mandela. That is very good. But you and, and the present government also must also acknowledge that there were people who have played a role. There's a history that needs to be untapped. There's untold stories, whether it's oral or documented or undocumented. 
those stories need to be told and they cannot ever be superseded by whether we live Mandela, when we go to the airport, whether you have Sisulu, PNC. So that history must be changed or we'll be caught in the new past. Okay, before before I ask the question, I don't have a question in fact, but I just want to take it all from what I have yet seen this morning. I also like to advise the artist there. The artist, the are you visual artist or visual artist? Your, your lecturer was saying something, but I need I feel I need to to come in on it. Um, we are enough, uh, that was the lesson that I gave this morning. But history, please take it with you to teach you the art. Whether it's, 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 it's Robert Sobukwe, whether it's black consciousness or pan Africanism, or whether it's Mahatma Gandhi, passive resistance, you must take it with you because those people were artists. And live with it and prove it through your art. Stop complaining, be in your corners and cry. We are all artists. But you need to show your art, you need to speak through your art, you need to challenge the status quo through the art. Because the art is a very powerful tool that you can use. It's the only tool of trade that you have. You are not politicians, but you can speak politics through the art. So please use the history. History is there, it can never be changed, and it's there for us to take it and use it to promote your artist, your, your talent. That is all what I want to say. So I have a question and it goes like, uh, if as a, as a person has necessary in telling narratives right now and giving people like, their own perspective, so was, was the horror all worth it at this point? That's what I'm saying. Well, that's my question. I think the fact that there are so many uh, streets, things named after Madiba is not the fault of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. In fact, Madiba himself used to get quite puzzled when people wanted to name things and that after him. Madiba always said that he was not alone in the struggle, it was part of a collective. And the mandate that he gave the Nelson Mandela Foundation was to celebrate others. So we've done many other things besides just looking at Madiba's legacy. Uh, in fact, the exhibition that we're going to unveil today, both were done by the Nelson Mandela Foundation. So the exhibition on Robert Sabukwe, we did it with the Sabukwe family, with uh, the Sabukwe Trust, uh, and that's what you're going to see. Uh, we're going to unveil a bit later. We've done exhibitions on... Um, uh, uh, the Sisulus, Parenting a Nation, both Albertina, Mama Sisulu, and Tata Sisulu, uh, on various other people as well. Um, Poison Pass is attempting to look at our difficult, difficult history that is not talked much about, uh, the use of uh, chemical and biological warfare, especially Project Coast. Um, Project Coast also um, was... Uh, um, affected Namibians. And in fact, the most, most people that were killed through that were Nobi Namibian Swapos, Swapo, con um, uh, uh, Swapo prisoners who were poisoned and then thrown out of a helicopter into the open sea while they were alive. So that it's, it's a very dark and difficult history. And I think Mariba acknowledged that he wasn't the only one in the long struggle for freedom uh, he wasn't the only one. And it used to puzzle him why people would want to just talk about him. And, uh, and so our, our mandate is to talk about more than just Madiba. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, I hope I understood the question. Uh, I'm going to respond into it the way I understood it. That it was... Was it all worth it, you know, the horror that people went through? Okay. Um, after, after going through a traumatic experience, because this horror that you, you I actually like the word that you're using, you're describing it as horror, this horrific experience that people go through was social. So social trauma, once you experience it, 
and you then retrospect. No one wants to go through trauma. No one. Especially for a, situa- for a situation where you need to assert your humanity. Where someone is denying you your humanity. When it happens, when the experience takes place, you have no choice but to deal with it, but to address it. And you go through that hor- horrific experience. So, but when you think back to it, was it worth it? It's a very difficult question. Um, but I will say, from my perspective, it was all worth it. It was all worth it, uh, be- mainly because um, it was a response. For me, that is very important. It was a response. It wasn't, it wasn't people involved in resistance initiating you know, this violence, inflicting this violence on a people. I think maybe those who were inflicting the violence maybe need to answer that question in terms of whether it was worth it or not. You know, but those who went through it as part of resisting it and defending their human, their human worth, I think it's worth it. That's why even now, what's taking place now, whatever that people go through when resisting and defending their humanity, it's always worth it at the end. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask Ubuntu Chamdane a question. Uh, but before, uh, one of my mentors says the heritage is a collective memory of the people who experience uh, in, in history. And in your presentation, you made the reference to uh, overseas or European countries. I was waiting for a reference from Ethiopia or Egypt, but uh, obviously you kept it overseas. And uh, what I believe personally is when we talk about decolonization, as much as I'm part of the conversation, uh, to decolonize, we still need the colonizer to approve, to say this is okay, you can decolonize. My question is, uh, talking about the heritage, especially coming from the, the Freedom Park, the narrative, the, the page of the scene narrative, I know you have exhibition around the ANC and the struggle, and it pushes that type of heritage or collective memory. The question is, in the Freedom Park, is it uh, decolonizing or reclaiming our history? Because uh, if it also pushes the ANC type of narrative, they still poison in the current, the present, and the future. It's still going to get poisoned because now uh, we're celebrating a few people and we're leaving other people out. As part of your freedom park, are you guys decolonizing, reclaiming, or are you just uh, putting artifacts in the space? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for the question. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say that uh, for the advantage of Freedom Park is that it was constructed post-apartheid. So, um, and uh, the um, theoretical foundations that actually informed the, it's, 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 uh, the research and development that took place, you know, that informed uh, the, 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 the construction of the Freedom Park, actually engaged with issues of heritage, you know, issues... Um, I remember we were talking about post museum. You know, what, what is a museum from an African perspective? Let me just give an example. I remember we were just be practical. You know, we were dealing with uh, the issue of how do we memorialize? You know, uh, how do we portray uh, African history? And then our question was. How have Africans memorialized their past? And, 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 and we had to go and interview people 
and deal with that information. And for an example, statues. Do we have a statue of Sekukuni, for an example? Do we have a statue of Shaga? Do we have a statue of Mushwesha? Why, why not? Why not? And one of the, of, of the important um, things that we discovered was that um, it's not about the physical appearance of the person, but is what that person contributed. And there is a form of poetry which is used, which memorializes and celebrates Africans. We all know the type of poetry. And it's, it's not a, 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 a monopoly of people in leadership to have the type of poetry. Everyone has the type of poetry. So heritage is actually democratized in, the, in, in, in that way. So I can actually uh, present myself in a biographical way, and in that way I'm presenting and portraying my legacy. Uh, you can actually introduce your, 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 your father or your grandfather in a particular form of poetry which actually portrays or puts across your heritage. And those are the things that we picked up. And uh, which actually deals with the issue of, as I indicate in terms of what theoretical perspectives are we going to use in engaging with issues of heritage. Now, uh, coming to the issue of uh, how is Freedom Park doing it. Uh, one of the important things that we have done, uh, we are, might be seen to be blowing, uh, we bl blowing our own trumpet, but we are the only institution, heritage institution in South Africa which has used the art of storytelling to mediate our heritage. We have employed fully, three fully employed uh, artists who are storytellers who are used for that purpose. So if someone wants to ask a question of how, is, how have artists been used in the development of Freedom Park, it's not about how they have been, it's how they are used. You know, say they are part and parcel. And also in terms of research and development, I'm, 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 I'm sure you've been to Freedom Park and you have seen the heritage landscape. We didn't use only uh, the narrative, you know, forms of representations or objects as usually uh, museums do. We also have artworks. We have Dumile Feni. We have statues of, of Dumile Feni at Freedom Park. So art has been used and we have promoted art in that way. So there is a number of ways that we can do. But remember, this was the first take in terms of engaging with issues of heritage. It can always be improved. And in the heritage industry, there is a process called front-end evaluation, where you actually evaluate the exhibition. After a specific period, you evaluate and you, 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 you re-design uh, uh, and represent the exhibition. Because the exhibition ages, you know. So, so I think as the new generation comes in in terms of Freedom Park and gets involved in that front-end evaluation, there will be improvement. But I think, I feel that the foundation that has been created is quite strong. Thank you. And I, I want to thank you, but I also want to say that please, um, don't let's don't get tired. Continue with the long march. Uh, the crowd is fertile. People are hungry to hear about uh, about Mona Lisa. Uh, as a book maker of my own myth, Dr. Yang, uh, Dr. Yang uh, I always tell myself that uh, when you get to heaven, uh, in the holies, you will meet uh, Matiba and Omar. And if you've been very committed to Africa, whatever race you are, uh, in the Holy of Holies, at the feet of the Pharaohs, uh, you will meet some people. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm very, uh, I appreciate as well uh, the contribution regarding uh, PW. 
And uh, also, we recently found out some of the things that you shared. Um, it's, it's quite interesting how, I always think it's a negative South African thing, of how we erase. You can erase a person whilst they still alive. But I still remember, in these last days in the wilderness, it sounded like a very, very concerning thing. And when you hear such, then you can understand. Because his own party and his own contribution was erased as he's living. And the, by the very people who then claim him. Uh, but I would like to ask uh, if you can say a few things about crossing the Rubicon speech, because that is the crossing the Rubicon, the speech in German, Genesis law. Uh, that is one speech that has been sung with a lot of fake news. Uh, I would appreciate just a few minutes, or then you can just share on that. Thank you. Thank you, T. <clears throat> yes, the Rubicon has had quite an interesting history, a lot of truths about it and a lot of uh, fake news around it. What usually happens in the office of the president and those around Mr. Mandela would also know that well, when a speech is on a general or on a broad issue, different state departments give contributions. So if it would have been on constitutional affairs, the department, Mr. Chris Yannis' department, gave an input. Relating to Department of Foreign Affairs, Pagbota's people would have given an input. The same with economic affairs, etc., etc. What happened was the different factions in the National Party clashed about moving forward with including blacks in a new dispensation for South Africa. And some officials at the Department of Constitutional Development were getting fed up with this, and their input to P.W. Boota was quite liberal and quite far-reaching. The Clark and East people were opposed to that. So realizing what was happening in cabinet, that there was pressure against, a, call it a liberal kind of speech, members of the Department of Constitutional Affairs leaked their draft to the, uh, I think the Cape Argus. And when P.W. Boota was driving out that Saturday morning to go horse riding, he saw this placard of the Cape Argus dramatic, dramatic announcements on their way. At the same time, Pugbota was in Europe to brief different governments, Margaret Thatcher and Helmut Kohl and others, about envisaged changes. Now, in the foreign affairs input, they had the little phrase, today we are crossing the Rubicon. And Pug... Hello? Can you still hear me? Pak Boota, as uh, enthusiastic as he was during his whole life, he went a bit overboard. And the same happened in America. And then an American senator came to South Africa and he met with P.W. Boota and he said, Oh, I'm glad to hear about all these dramatic developments in the constitutional area. Pak Boota, uh, P.W. Boota said, Now, where do you get that? And he said, Pak Boota told me. And then P.W. Boota got a bit fed up and ultimately used very little of the inputs from foreign affairs, constitutional development, economic affairs, finance and so on. Just bits and pieces like the piece from constitution, uh, foreign affairs saying today we are crossing the Rubicon. But by the time he made the speech, there was so much pressure on him. Pak Boota told this to the Europeans and Americans this was leaked to the Cape Argus. He was getting fed up with being told by all and sundry what he was going to say. So he put his drafted speech on one side and essentially said, I will not be told how I will develop South Africa. <laughs> um, just briefly again... Um, the reason why the rand fell, and we can relate that to what's been going on over the past five years or so as well, 
was the expectations because the news was getting out PW Buota was going to make massive announcements. The clerk kept on pushing against it. Newspaper president, foreign people, and when the newspapers were sitting at the venue in Durban and P.W. Boota did not announce the release of Mr. Mandela, he was in favor of it, but others in cabinet were not. And because he were not, did not at that stage announce the political changes involving black people in South Africa that constitutional development had proposed, they said, oh, here we go again. And that's when the rant started falling. It's directed to Jabulani. You indicated that South Africa is not special. You used the word exception in that other countries have also experienced um, a violent past and that left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth in that whether other people have experienced violence, we still did and we should be allowed to deal with it in any form uh, we see fit. So it's just a comment, but uh, my question is what's your, what's your stance in, how, in the exhibition of atrocities in museums and how explicit do you think people should go? And then the second one is um, directed to Brother Tando. Uh, you mentioned, well, I, I'm also aware just how difficult it's, it's, it is for to locate Babsobukwa in the history. So what are you as a foundation, well, the strides that, are there any strides that you're making as a foundation to try and locate him in the archival materials anywhere in the world? And are you getting any support or are you collaborating with other institutions in doing that? Thanks. All right. Um, thank you so much uh, for the question. Firstly, I'm, I'm, I'm just tempted to say a few words on, on the question that you directed to Upu Chablan about atrocities in museums and uh, how, how far we should go, you know, uh, in perhaps displaying those atrocities. You know, um, one of the greatest challenges that we have and I'm saying this as a young person myself, as a challenge which I've experienced, is that in post-1994 South Africa, you know, we tend to whitewash our history and downplay our history. And for me, what this does is that it desensitizes us, you know, I usually say we're no longer emotionally connected as African people to the experience of what our people went through. Simply because our history is not told in the manner that I think we should be telling it. I spoke earlier about the Black House Collective. We at the Black House Collective, we have developed something that we call the Sankofa Exhibition. The Sankofa Exhibition are pictures which we've never seen displayed in any a museum or any public institution. Images particularly of the atrocities, some of the most gruesome atrocities, Uma spoke about Iswapo, the killings of the Swapo uh, soldiers. You know, we have those images where you have Europeans or white people posing with a gun with their kill right in front of them. But there are many other images which also show and tell these atrocities. I mean, images of the lynchings in America, uh, the lynchings that took place in Zimbabwe, throughout the African continent in Angola, the murders that were being orchestrated by the colonialists. And what I've seen is that when African people see these images, there's something that happens within them. They become emotionally connected 
to their past. And I usually call this shock therapy. That's what we call it at the Black House. We call it shock therapy because somehow it awakens you, it touches you, it connects you to that pain and that history of that suffering. So I just wanted to say those few words, who Puchablani will answer in his own way. With regards to uh, the Sobukwe in the archive and what we are doing, more than 10 years ago and five years ago, uh, who is the executive director of the Robert Sobukwe Trust and uh, the son of Robert Sobukwe. He traveled all around the world, going to various institutions, history institutions, uh, media institutions, people who may have at one time or another came in South Africa and met and interviewed Sobukwe. None of them have any records of Sobukwe. But Dini Sobukwe traveled the world over, Netherlands, America, anywhere you can think. All the institutions say they don't have any records of Sobukwe's uh, voice. Secondly, one of the other interesting things about Sobukwe is that even if you go to the Department of Justice, Sobukwe testified in court, spoke in court. Those records of his testimony in court are not there. You can't find them anywhere. But what is also interesting is that you not only don't you find the audio recordings, it's interesting that even on the records themselves, the transcripts themselves, the testimony of Sobuko was expunged. You do not find what Sobuko said before the courts. And so this is what I call the conspiracy of silence around Obao Robert Mangaliso Sobuko. Departments of Arts and Culture, Departments of Justice, the SABC, all of them, they don't even have records of Sobukwe's funeral, for that matter. You know, this is something that took place now in 1978. There is no institution in this world that says it has the voice of Ubao Mangaliso Sobukwe. Last year, in closing, in answering that question, last year, there is a publicly available interview of Sobukwe, which is transcribed. And what it means, when it says it's, it's transcribed, people can correct me. I assume that it, it may have been recorded somewhere. That interview was done by Professor Gail Gerard. It's more than 100 pages. And so last year I had an opportunity to meet Professor Gail Gerard at Vets University. And I interviewed her about her interviews with Sobukwe and with Steve Biko. She has the audio recordings of the interview with Steve Biko. More than two hours long interview with Biko. But she told me that the interview with Sobukwe, it was not recorded. She told me that all those more than 100 pages of what she wrote, she memorized it. And uh, she took a few notes which she hid in her underwear because Sobukwe uh, was a banned person at that time. And I'm going to say here, I mean, I never believed her. But, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know, seriously. There, there is no institution, my sister, in the world right now in this country that is assisting the Robert Sobukwe family or the Robert Sobukwe Trust in trying to source out Sobukwe's voice. There are no efforts by even our government to try and say Sobukwe is a person of national interest. Let us try and uncover his voice just to hear the sound of how Sobukwe may have you know, sounded when he was speaking. So that is my answer to you, my sister. Thanks very much, uh, my brother. I think for touching on that question, you actually assisted the one that I'm still going to respond to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on issues of uh, the issue of exceptionalism, uh, I apologize if the message or the information, you know, my message wasn't conveyed well. Uh, the critical, the, the, the challenge with portraying yourself, your experience, as ex exceptional is that you then um, 
take away the, 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 the agency to actually deal with the issue. And at times, you then basically bask on that issue and not address it. You know, and uh, most countries which portray themselves as exceptional, they always fall into the same trap. You know, the United States, you know, portrays itself as this exceptional country, you know. Uh, what is the, the land of the free? Uh, the land of the free? Land of the free? Is everyone free in the United States of America? Yeah. Uh, it's the land of... He's reminding me of the American Indians when you talk about the land of the free. That it's, it's the land... Uh, it's, it's, it's a country that basically distributes democracy all over the world, you know. At times they even enforce it by war. That, that is what exceptionalism could lead to, where you say we are the owners of democracy and we can go around the world distributing it, you know, even enforcing it on people. And those are the challenges of exceptionalizing something. The, ex the South African experience is part of the colonial experience. It's part of the settler colonial experience. It's part of the imperialism that actually took place. And it's a global experience. In Africa as a continent, I mean, all the African states went as something which is very much similar to what we went through. So there's nothing much exceptional about us. Um, and, but what does that mean? Why should we avoid this exceptionalism? It's because we need to link up with those countries that have addressed these issues and engage with them, find out how they address them, and then move forward as countries that they've overcome these challenges and learn from them and then move forward. So that's the, 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 the most important thing about avoiding portraying yourself as exceptional, you know, is that you are part of a global experience. You need to then unite your efforts and also learn about efforts which others actually uh, took. Uh, on the issue of... Uh, Exhibitions, you know, exhibiting uh, atrocities. Uh, the most important thing about an exhibition, it's the goals of, the, of an exhibition. What is it that you want to achieve through that exhibition? If you want to exhibit violence for violence's sake, well, I don't think that's going to help. My brother helped me. If it's violence to shock you, and it's, it's shock therapy. So it's therapy, it's healing. Then that makes sense. So, which basically answers that question. Um, groups that come now in our spaces where you have all the peoples of South Africa you know, represented in those groups. And when one takes through people in our exhibition, which I believe is actually... Inclusive, because we have uh, Robert Mangaleso Sobugwe there to, in the color of leaders as one of the leaders who contributed in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the leaders who contributed into changing our humanity. We've got him there. We've got basically, uh, we've got Kwame Nkrumah. We've got uh, Luve Chatu Saint, you know, from Haiti. We've got all of them. We try to be inclusive. But then the important thing is, when these groups come, these primary school learners, they're coming, they're hugging each other, you know, they are smiling. Are you going to tell a story of apartheid in a way which is going to make them act violently to each other when they leave Freedom Park? Or are you going to tell a story in a way that's going to make them understand each other more and work of ways of working together for the future of South Africa. So the aim of your presentation, your aim of your exhibition is a critical thing. Thank you.
Ladies, gentlemen, I know there are burning questions, I, I understand. So we also need to get our tummies uh, starting to feel a bit woozy and, uh, you know, food is calling. I can, I can hear it um, out, out of my ear. Yeah, it's there it's again. So unfortunately, we'll have to cut it short now. Um, I'd just like to ask our panel for closing remarks. And once that is, is done, I will then call on our um, CEO to, to give the closing um, statements. Okay. So we can, I don't know, go down the line, I suppose, for, for closing. We can start on that side this time. Uh, it's just some closing statements, please. Um, thank you. Thank you, too. Just very briefly, as I said earlier, the older I get, the more I learn. And even today was for me an extremely valuable learning experience. In the sense that we always tend to look from our own perspective, forgetting that there are other perspectives. And I think that's perhaps the greatest value of a discussion such as this. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank... Uh, the Tsong Museums for creating this atmosphere for us to share this information. And I'd like to apologize for anything that I said which people might have uh, felt that it, was, it didn't sit well with them. And uh, what I would like to say finally is that I would like to propose that we own our heritage uh, starting with our personal heritage. You know, our individual heritage. Who am I? You know, who, who am I? And, and unpack that for ourselves. And then I think that's going to take us somewhere. Thank you. I'd like to echo the, the, the other panelists by thanking uh, the organizers for this uh, opportunity. Uh, memory work in South Africa is not finished. It's an ongoing process and it's a difficult terrain. And we have much still to heal our nation with. Uh, just as a quick example, um, I was in Argentina last year, and they also have a very violent past where the you know people disappeared, and they had uh, they had memorialized one of those episodes. So all it was was a room, which you would go in. There's nothing anywhere, and you would hear then sounds, and then what? And then when you leave the room, it says this is what the people who were detained in this facility would have heard. So there was a stadium like maybe two kilometers away from the torture center. And when people disappeared, they were taken to this torture center. And they could hear like life outside. They could hear the soccer masters at the stadium. And that's what you, do, you, would, you would imagine. And I think that's actually quite powerful because there's not much involved in that kind of memorialization. So it's something worth thinking about. I'd also like to join the choir and thank the organizers of this event for the opportunity <laughs> um, to share these few words with you. And uh, I want to also, in closing, just state that um, Sobu Kwe is not a man who believed himself to be exceptional or to be some exclusive superhuman being. He himself was part and parcel of a broader collective of people, a number of many other people who remain, whose voices remain silenced, whose experiences continue to be erased in our post-1994 uh, dispensation. And I think the honors is upon each one of us to tell our stories, the stories of the you know, ordinary people of this country who on a daily basis contribute in shaping, you know, our communities and in our societies. I mean, I mentioned earlier um, Mama Sobukwe. Mama Sobukwe, you know, stay uh, uh, in the weeks before she passed away, she was admitted at a hospital called Midlands Hospital, a public hospital. She was with seven other ordinary grandmothers from the Hrafreinet uh, community of Umasizake Township. 
She had no security or no fancy things around her. She had the same doctors that everyone had access to. And this is the people that we are talking about when we are talking about the Sobukwa family and ordinary people. And so let us continue to tell our own stories. But also I heard that there are artists here. I, you know, would charge the artists and say, write stories about Sobukwe. Write plays about Sobukwe. Write songs about Sobukwe. You know, paint whatever you paint, poetry about Robert Sobukwe. You know, uh, and I will end it there. Give thanks. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the closing statements. I'd now like to call on our CEO, uh, Mem Annabelle Lebete, to give the closing statements. Thank you. Uh, afternoon, everybody. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to extend my heartfelt appreciation and gratitude to the panelists. And as collaborators, I think as centers that are tasked with preserving, conserving our collective memory, we are collaborators in this, in this minefield of, of work. And there's still more that needs to be done. I'd also like to thank the team, uh, Dr. Salani, Director of Cultural History Museum, uh, Le Mohang and Frank for putting up the exhibition, but also to appreciate and to recognize my board member, Dr. Paul Bayless, for being here today and spending the day with us. I think there's, there's so much more that can be said and should be said. You know, I think in the work that we do as, as collecting and preserving memory, we are only but at the skimming the top of the surface. You know, I think there's so many other stories, known and unknown stories, that need to be told, that should be told, that need to come to the forefront. And Osiki, the morning you were saying that we're tired of the Steve B cause and we're tired of, I guess, the known, the known icons in our histories. You know, but uh, we all share a collective responsibility to unearth and to present and to say, but my grandmother, my grandfather was involved in this and this away, you know? And if we, if we as South Africans are not interested in our histories or shaping and changing that narrative of our histories, we will continue to only be hearing this singular narrative, you know? And I think it's, it's a disservice and an injustice and an indictment on all of us. We, we have to be concerned about the legacies and the impact of these stories that we're leaving for, for our generations. I would also like to, to, to put my, my team, um, uh, to put their names forward, because I think this conversation is a, is a conversation that's only starting. I think us all sitting here today want to hear more, and I'm particularly interested in the work that you guys do, because I think young people need to come into the space. We're fortunate in that we work here, we engage with our collaborators and our partners on a daily basis, but we're probably not doing enough about involving young people in these stories and how we tell these stories, and I'm fascinated by the work that you guys are doing. So I want to say that this is, it's not a Zizong space, it's a South African space. And if you're not buying into that South African space, Zizong can only but tell so much. Freedom Park can only but tell so much. The Black House Collective can only but tell so much. So I, I really invite you into the space, to own the space, to know that it's a I always say that we are only bad custodians, you know? We only have these jobs because we are serving a role of preserving and protecting it. But it's not just our story to tell and to share. You know, it's a South African story. So please see this as your space. See it as a public space. See it as a space for engagement, for, for debating, for questioning, for saying, you know, like you, I'm, I'm sort of fatigued. There's a, there's a national historical fatigue by the one-sidedness of the stories that we hear. And we have to be brave enough and bold enough to challenge institutions like Dizong and institutions like the Nelson Mandela Foundation and Freedom Park and so many other spaces about reflecting that which is relevant to us, but not losing sight of the history. I think this, the history is important to guide us and to shape us and to challenge us as a, as a contemporary society. We can't lose sight of that history, and there's so, many, there's so much to learn. I, sitting here today, I just feel like there's so much that I personally don't know, you know, about, not only about Robert Subukwe, but so many other heroes known and unknown in our histories, you know, and it's, it's not right. So we will take on that challenge to correct those narratives. You know, our, our role, we've got space, guys. 
the one thing that we do have space, that we do have is space. So next week, Saturday, Tando, you know, just say, guys, we're here. If anybody's interest has come, we've got names on, everybody signed in, you know. We will organize to host a conversation sitting in the exhibition room. You're all invited. It's not planned. It's not part of the program. But I think it's, it's a way that demonstrates we have to keep on talking as a nation and we have to, to find ourselves. We have to find each other because I think we're losing each other in the midst of this crazy world that we live in. And that's what museums do. This is what this museum is about and the rest of our museums. So uh, please can we take that on? You know, If you feel that there's stories that you want to come and present and say, I want to have a dialogue with just young people on any topic that's historical and relevant to us as a society today, come. If it's about kids, it's lovely to see Mpo's daughter, I think that's sitting next to her, in this audience today. You know, Bring your kids, hear the story. You know, We really need to teach our kids about our people. It's about our people, you know. So with that said, um, thank you so much. I, I really have learned a massive of, gained a lot from this conversation. And I know all of us just want to sit and listen and listen because we can learn so much. With that said, I'm handing back to you. Thank you, everybody. And I look forward to a wonderful exhibition. Tell your family, tell your friends, not only about cultural history, but all our spaces and all the exhibitions that we have. And we look forward to seeing you through the doors anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, C. Okay, uh, we will now, from this space, we will go through to the exhibition area where um, you'll be able to see and view the exhibition. Once we have done that, we will have lunch on the right-hand side of this. So as you walk out on the right, um, on the patio outside or in the um, conference room. Okay, thank you very much. And, okay, I'm not going to do it. I, I've always wanted to do this. You know, an MC, when you're finished, you drop the mic. Boom. I'm not going to do it. Thank you very much, please. Uh, On behalf of the Tsung Museums of South Africa, um, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, and the Robert Buckley Foundation, we now let's do the honors and declare this exhibition now open. Please come in, come in, come through, come in. I'm <laughs> sorry.